Mega Evolution seemed to be pretty hit or miss in the community, but it's almost like a love it or hate it situation. But as a concept, I do find it pretty fascinating. The idea of a temporary form change to take a Pokemon to the next level reminds me of something similar to Dragon Ball Z, and I just think that has a lot of potential. With a Pokemon Legends game coming next year, it does appear that they're going to be back, and since I've been thinking about a run like this for well over a year, I think it's time to grab yourself a Sodi Pop and let's see what would happen if you put Mega Charizard X into Pokemon Red. As usual, this is a solo challenge and the full rules are in the description. And like all my cross-generation runs, we'll have all the goodies, the new moves, and the stats. Now first of all, Mega Charizard X has a significant boost in the stats, especially when you look at the vanilla Generation 1 Charizard. Everything here is exceptional across the board, besides the HP. The HP is not that good, but having 130 in both attack and special makes it a pretty fearsome mix attacker. For the learn set, I'm going to be modeling this off of Generation 7, and it's a really great set. As usual, any of the level 1 moves here are fair game for me to use, and what makes Gen 7 stand out is Shadow Claw, and I, I couldn't resist this move. I'll also be using Flare Blitz as a move that I tried to add two times to different ROMs, and it just never found a single use in those runs. Then we have Dragon Claw for reasons we'll get to in just a second. And then there's Air Slash. It, it just made the most sense. It's not going to see a ton of use, but it's there. Outside of the beefed up stats, the Elite Learn Set, Mega Charizard X, it infamously shed its flying typing in favor of the dragon type which is something we probably all thought Charizard should have had from the beginning and that's the big draw of the run for me personally just to see how it would impact the run and as a starter we get the blessing of being in the medium slow leveling group and with how Flygon performed I was just excited to figure this one out. At the start of the game I keep things very minimalistic I only fight the mandatory bug catcher and here we can quickly talk about Flare Blitz. It's an extremely powerful 120 base power move it's essentially a fire type double edge with a 10% burn chance, but I will say up front that the lower base HP and the recoil, they don't really mix that well with a streamlined run trying to climb on top of a tier list, but we'll come back to that soon because it's time to take a look at Brock. Notice I'm a mere 10 experience away from being level 8. I was supposed to fight one wild like Rattata along the way and I forgot. But in my defense, this was like my 5th or 6th Charizard X run. And I was just so focused on the details later in the run that it just kind of slipped my mind. Now the side effect of skipping this is that the Geodude can survive 2 Dragon Claws. And that ends up making the battle take just a little longer. But I do think if you factor in the time it would take to find a wild encounter, one shot it, and then go through the end of battle techs. Honestly, it's probably just faster to spend an extra turn here. So maybe we we can just chalk this up to a happy accident. Now as you can see there's not much detail to cover here, it's straight Dragon Claw for a pretty fast Brock split overall. And I know sometimes I get comments, people might say, what is the point of making a Pokemon this good that just steamrolls the game? Is it not too easy and just boring? And the point of these runs of any Pokemon in any timeline, I want to see if they can match the dominance of Mewtwo in Generation 1. You can see how well it did in its run. And in my opinion, Gen 1 Vanilla Mewtwo is the strongest iteration of any playable Pokemon ever. And it's really fun for me to see what can surpass it. Now at this point, only six out of about 20 plus runs have passed it, and that's just the basis of all this. On the flip side, I would also argue in general that an optimized run full of a lot of thought and strategical overworld movement, route planning, and precise gameplay where even one single reset or a mistake can cost you a lot on a competitive tier list is a lot more fun to play or watch than maybe doing like a Zubat run where the main strategy is just to outlevel your opponent by 20 something levels because its stats and its moves are so bad. But maybe that's just me. I digress. Let's get back to the run. On Route 3 and Mount Moon, there's zero optional battles because they're just, they're not needed. And at the end, I will hit level 17, and here's the main and virtually the only advantage of being a Dragon type has in Gen 1, other than the fact that flying is just an awful subtype to have, and it's that it eliminates the water weakness from fire, and what this means in the short term is that it allows us to take on Misty immediately. Fire and Dragon pair well, especially in modern day Pokemon, but I can't lie to you guys, having Shadow Claw here probably helps out more. Charizard hits hard, but the guaranteed crit along with super effective damage against Starmie is the real MVP. And if you're wondering, I've touched on this before, but I did fix the bug where Psychic is immune to Ghost, just so we can see cool moves like this kind of flourish and do really well and work correctly. But getting the Misty experience is pretty big to keep up pace with the run. 
Hopping into rival number two, the only answer you have for Pidgeot is Flare Blitz. You can see on the overlay it has a massive 180 effective power, and this is the type of situation you need to call upon it, because nothing else really comes close to one-shotting the tanky bird. The rest of the battle is just going to fall like dominoes, not really worth going over, but just to touch on Flare Blitz, because I just really like the move a lot and it needs some explaining, this is its niche. Its purpose is to be like a situational nuke, maybe to hit one-shot ranges, or maybe to close out a battle, or maybe just to deal with a problematic Pokemon, but let's talk about what that has to do with clusters. Now in that battle, Flare Blitz did 13 damage and recoil back to us. And at first glance, you might be saying 13 damage, big whoop, who cares, wanna fight about it. Now first off, 13 health. That's 20% of our total health at this point in the game. And second, come on guys, you're dealing with the highest density of mandatory battles in the entire game. So even if you just wanted to Flare Blitz your little heart out, you would be dead within five turns. The main thing about Flare Blitz is that in a cross-gen run setting, trying to compete with the absolute best of the best means that inherently that comes with barely healing, not going into your menu to use potions, saving time every spot that you can, and I guess to finally maybe just like wrap up this line of thought and summarize what I'm trying to say is that misusing this move or just using it too much will make the run significantly worse. Now this is a little section I'm going to be talking about some things that are normally great in a vanilla run that I will be skipping and I just don't need. The first is Dig and I bring it up because vanilla Charizard, it used Dig to great effect. It really needed it and normally it's a solid move, but hey, hot take alert here. I don't think Gen 1 Dig is an elite move. Spreading the 100 base power over two turns leaves it to pretty much only being a 50 base power move and the only reason that it's so highly regarded is because outside of the cube online with its signature moves, the game is just so starved for ground coverage. You only have two options. I will say as a tool for like overworld time saves, Dig is pretty much an honorary TM. It's pretty mandatory. It's really great in that regard, but overall I'm not here to debate the rankings of moves. I think we can just scooch on down to the SSN. Here I'm going to be skipping everything. Body Slam is not needed and Air Slash kind of fills Body Slam's role when Shadow Claw can't be used. And I'll also be skipping that rare candy, so it's just really straight down to business. And when we look at Rival number three, it's a near exact duplicate of Rival two. I got a Flare Blitz opening just to ensure that no sand attacks slip through the cracks and everything else just falls down pretty easy. It's really simple. For Surge, there's no need to overcomplicate things, and I guess we'll talk about Shadow Claw for a second. For high crit rate moves, the effective power is shown on the overlay, just in case you're maybe new to the videos, or maybe you haven't seen it yet. And for the vast majority of the game, this is going to be my go-to move in neutral situations like we got here. I think last time I brought this up, someone in the comments asked why I didn't do this for all moves based on the crit rate, and I just, I think that's overly complicated and just overall unnecessary. High crit rate moves in Gen 1 are just really unique, especially since since crit rate goes off your base speed, having something that can crit 100% of the time, it's worth displaying its true power because sometimes it's hard to tell. After the battle, here's something that I touched on in another video. I don't remember which one it was, but I'm going to run it back. This is one of those runs where I'm essentially just not going to pick up anything extra. So right here, I'm just going to be going to the very bottom of my bags, deleting Thunderbolt, getting it out of there. To elaborate a little on this, this is because when I get to Celadon, I don't care about money. Thunderbolt at this point will be the only extra item that I have to get rid of, and I can just easily do it here when I know exactly where it's at in my bags. It's a little bit faster, and just one of those little tiny things. It's also the third gym, and that means that it's time for split data. Remember, we're going against Mewtwo. It's always Mewtwo. That's the time that all the cross-gen runs race against. And to this point, it's really close, but our little powered up Charizard, it's only managed a mere seven second lead to this point. So it's really up in the air about how this is gonna go at the end of the day. I will say it's worth noting that there's very little variance in Lieutenant Surge when a run's really good. Any run that's top tier or something like that will have a time very similar to this, at give or take 30 seconds, I guess. But we can skip over Rock Tunnel. Let's fight some goons in Celadon. 
the rocket hideout is very simple this week very similar to cliff Ferry on the last video and this is how any good run is going to handle it i'm not going to pick up any high money items it's just going to be a straight line path i'm getting in getting out as fast as i can as for giovanni i do have something to say believe it or not and let's focus on dragon claw now this is just like an 80 base power move there's no additional effects it does get stab and remember that dragon is a special type in gen 1 for this run its job is going to be to take out things with higher defense or lower special and the really cool thing that really isn't talked about is how good dragon type moves are in neutral situations and i guess it's not talked about in gen 1 for good reason because dragon rage is the only dragon move and it just has set damage and what's neat about doing runs like this what's cool about seeing all this play out is you get to see moves like this in action see how they would play out but there are just like a lot of situations like this or maybe the boomer hacker and rock tunnel that we didn't look at where it just does its job really well the Celadon shopping is about as light as it gets. I've already kind of touched on it earlier with dropping Thunderbolt. And the only thing really happening here is that I will be getting Rock Slide to learn later. And I'm going to foreshadow something for you guys. I think the fault and where this Pokemon falls a little bit short is the reliance on several vanilla TMs later just to push through some parts of the game. And we're going to see like a very familiar move change later. But at the end of the day, there's just enough lacking with this Pokemon to where the coverage feels a little bit off. But we'll get to all that in time. Charizard's typing gives Erica nightmares, so this is the next logical place to go. I just go Flare Blitz on the Victory Bell just to make 100% sure that I can deep fry it. And after that, Air Slash is just good enough for the rest of the fight. I know I haven't really talked in depth about Air Slash, but it's just a move. It does have a flinch chance, but I never really found it great in any situation outside of where it's super effective. That's going to get us another badge. Let's skip over Pokemon Tower, and today I'm actually gonna catch the Snorlax. I didn't really need to. This is kind of like a leftover thing from another route that I never changed. I probably should have got the Lapras. It would have been a little bit faster, but I think you just have to sit down and admit, hey, it's pretty cool when you catch that Snorlax. So after that, we're gonna blitz through the Safari Zone, and it's already time for Sylph. I have a little bit to say at this stage in the run. I had a pretty solid route before this that took a different path and I would grit my teeth, you do some extra battles, use some candies and I would take on Koga first. And when we got to the end of the run, my final times and just my overall results, they just were not that satisfying to me considering how good this Pokemon felt to play. So in the optimized run, I am going to Sylph first today. And as much as I would love to cut out everything extra and tell you that this is the most streamlined run ever, I do need to go to the 10th floor. Now I feel like we've seen this a lot but the way things went in practice it made an earlier hard pivot on the learn set necessary just to kind of make the rest of the game quicker and there's really no better way to do that than learn earthquake learn rock slide and get sword stance to boost our attack when it's needed i did lots of routes lots of changes and tweaks with this run and i really wanted to avoid this trap here with sword stance because it felt kind of cool to to use things like dragon claw on lance or shadow claw on agatha and it felt pretty good but ignoring these clear move upgrades here it just led to a run where I slowly felt like I was running out of gas and this is just the refill that you need to keep things going fast and smooth but that's pretty much it for that section we learned three new moves flare blitz is still kind of hanging around and now I think we can take a look at rival number five Now that we've gen one the learn set, you know how things are going to play out. Knowing how much or if you even need to set up a Swords Dance is the key to slimming down the time. And times one is the play here. It's simple enough, but I do take a sand attack and now I have anxiety, so thanks for that. On Growlithe, I do set up one more time and that was because the Pidgeot was a one shot with a single setup and taking too many turns just opened you up to a sand attack, but you saw how that played out. And the long and the short of this fight is times one is good enough for everything outside of Blastoise and while a second second setup later doesn't really save you any turns, it just means that I won't have to roll the dice twice trying to hit with 66% accuracy on the tanky turtle, but thankfully I only missed like one time during this whole part, so it doesn't really cost me any of my sanity. Since I'm already in Saffron, I will be taking on Sabrina right now. Koga would be easier, but this is just really efficient. And the only real analysis here is I set up once because I don't outspeed the Alakazam and I just want to ensure the one shot. It does set up Reflect and I'm not 100% I'm not sure if I can just one shot it through that, but I do just bypass it with a crit and we can just be on our way. 
Next on our cleanup tour, it takes us to Koga, and we have Earthquake. I set up once just to get ranges on the Weezing, and it's a really quick and painless process. And I guess I'll talk about the previous iteration of the route where I went here earlier, and to summarize that real quick, rather than it being six total turns like it is here, it was like 17 total turns. I want to say the Coughings had a two-shot range, and then the Weezing and the Muck both had three-shot range, so they got a lot of turns. I took a lot of turns, so it's one of those things where it was a pretty big difference, and I knew that I probably needed to go to Seal first to save a little bit of time. Now it's time for that brisk swim down to Cinnabar to soak in some sun, take in some scenery. And the only optional thing today is just taking a little bit of time to see if TM28 is actually Tombstoner, brother, or not. And then it's just time for Blaine. It's just like Koga, it's a simple matter of one setup for the Arcanine guaranteed one shot range. Makes this quick, makes this really easy, and that's going to take us directly into the final gym. And stop me if you've heard this one before, but one setup, that's going to get us a guaranteed one shot on the final Pokemon, that's going to be the play. It's straightforward, it's very simple, I just hit the earthquake button a few times. And if you're wondering, maybe you're looking here saying, hey, why are you so hurt? Like, why is your Charizard almost dead? It's because of the triple fighter black belt right before this. It was a lot quicker just to use flare blitz three times, and this is the result of that recoil damage. But it doesn't matter, we get through this fight pretty easy. After the battle, I use an elixir and I use potions rather than visit the center, probably about the same total time. But here's the key thing, I burn all of my rare candies, and I'll talk more about rare candy usage very soon, but let's just hop into rival number 6 and just get that out of the way first. The great thing about boosting our level here up to level 55 is that I don't even need to set up. I, j I got ranges on every single Pokemon and I can just mow down his team by utilizing my moves. And there's one single concession on this fight and it's Blastoise. It's normally a two shot most of the time. Now here it's going to go for withdrawal after my first turn and that means it's going to annoyingly barely survive, get an extra turn and just waste a little bit more time. But at the end of the day it's still pretty clean, nothing really worth complaining about. And now we're just looking ahead at the Elite Four. Before we get into anything else, let's pull up split data, and last time it was really close. 7 second lead for Charizard, and going into Lorelei's room to start the Elite Four, it's really not that much different. Here Charizard is behind 11 seconds, and I kinda wanna call myself out here, maybe you noticed, I know I noticed. You might wonder, hey, why was I 26 seconds ahead of Mewtwo on Giovanni, but then I lost a lot of time going into the Elite Four? And there's a few reasons, the main two reasons was I had to do a lot of inventory, I had to use candies, elixirs, potions, all that kind of stuff. And the second thing was that Blastoise survived at the end it wasted just a little bit of our time and there's a real minor reason here you might notice in some of the footage in the background that I'm not using the bike right here now for whatever reason my bike movement felt awful in this run my controller didn't feel quite as responsive maybe I was playing too much gen 2 before this but that reason is pretty insignificant but the TLDR here is that this one's still pretty close now there's one thing I would like to address and it's gen 1 and the fire top the thing to jot down here and to take note of is that in generation 1 fire does not resist ice. In a run like Articuno, really good run, you can take advantage of this on fights like Blaine, but when you are the fire top paired with something like, let's say the dragon top, it means that you're actually weak to Lorelei. Now this is the reason I didn't use a bunch of candies early even though I probably would have loved to, and this is the reason I didn't cut out more of the run. If you can't get past the dugong fairly quick, things can start to get really messy, and I just wanted to put myself into a position to make this as fast as possible and not be as risky as something like Flygon. Now here's something I went back and forth on and I think it's an interesting topic. I thought maybe I should change the fire type to actually resist ice here because it would just allow you to potentially shave several minutes off the run. On one hand you could think about it, hey if I fix the psychic ghost immunity maybe this would make sense and I don't really agree. I think the psychic immunity to ghost, it's an actual bug. It deserves to be fixed. And what this ultimately came down to for me is that if I'm modernizing the top charts, would I ever consider doing things like maybe making the bug top not super effective to poison? And if the answer is no, then why would I change fire and ice interaction? And I just think that's what made me decide to leave it as it is at the end of the day. I do think Mega Charizard X is a really cool Pokemon, but I don't think it's special enough to modify how the core of the game actually works just to make it have a better run. Like I said earlier, it is an interesting discussion, and if you have any thoughts on that, I would love to hear what you think down below. But that's pretty much it. We don't do any training, we don't pick up anything extra, and let's just let's see how it plays out.
So I guess you'll see here, this is something to not really talk about the battle, but on the Dugong, you're gonna see that it really doesn't do that much damage after I set up a Swords Dance. Now what 55 does, just to summarize the entire battle right here real quick, is that one Swords Dance puts everything into a guaranteed one-shot range. Not guaranteed on some of them. If I crit, I would not one-shot, but it's pretty close. And I just go for like a rock side sweep here outside of the Cloister where I can actually utilize Flare Blitz to take care of it. And when you watch back the footage and I play the runs, originally I was coming here at like level 53 and it felt like it was slightly risky, but then I came here at level 55 and it seems like it's too easy. So there's like a really fine line and I wonder if maybe I made some mistakes in the routing. I always kind of second guess myself sometimes and maybe I'll do another Charizard X run. But Lorelai's really clean. It's something that I was really worried about, especially in practice trying to come here at like level 50. But you can see that it's really not that bad when you have such high special. Next up is Bruno, and I can get through this one really quick. Times two setup to get to plus four attack. We'll put everything into a one-shot range. Now you needed a plus one no matter what, and I just like to go ahead and make sure the Machamp is a one-shot too, just so I can hold down the button, get to the end of the fight a little bit quicker. But it's Bruno, and I'm using my vanilla Pokey Red assembly right here. So everything's like vanilla Pokemon Red Sprite. So I don't have Hiker Anthony today, so maybe you can forgive me for that. Taking a look at Agatha, this one's very simple. There's no setups required at all and I have really good ranges guaranteed earthquake ranges on all the non-flying types and what I love about being level 58 here is that it makes the goal bad about like a 77% chance to be a one shot so it's a really painless battle in other iterations of the route I feel like I say that a lot goal bat had like a about a 50 50 chance of surviving and if it got off a of haze it could be a little bit more annoying but this one we just have the tools for the job the outcome here is not really a surprise to anybody now we have Lance and you might be thinking Gyarados fire type uh oh uh, but the thing is, we're not weak to water, so it doesn't really matter. And we've seen already on Lorelei how like super effective damage doesn't even do that much. So a neutral hydro pump doesn't matter. And if you want to know how much it doesn't matter, just I didn't even bother to heal. I just really don't care at this point. I'm trying to make it through as fast as I can. You can see the time's getting really close to Mewtwo. And the ultimate answer, and, and the answer to life itself, usually for the Charizard run here, is times one setup. It'll put the Gyarados into Rock Slide range, uh, Aerodactyl, Dragonite 2, and I can just use the more accurate Earth quake on the dragon air so pretty clean everything's been pretty clean so far let's just take a look at that final battle The final solution for this fight's fairly straightforward. Just set up two times. That's all you need, and that's pretty much what will get you quickly to the end of the fight. So plus four on our attack, two swords dance, take out the Pidgeot, I don't care what it does, and we're just set up to sweep. Now from there, Alakazam, Rhydon, Arcanine, they're all easy one shots with Earthquake. And here, let me talk about Executor. I'm low, I'm not healing because I'm trying to save as much time as possible. I have not used a full restore for the entirety of the Elite Four, and I was too scared to go for flare blitz on the executor i went for rock slide and i crit which means i didn't one shot it and i actually want to know would i would i have died if i used flare blitz here to the recoil let me check that real quick the answer is no i would have took precisely 50 points in recoil damage and i would have survived and i would have looked like a big giga chad and everybody would have been wow what a play but i didn't do it because i'm a little coward i didn't want to have a reset here and at the end blastoise is a one shot and that's pretty much the run over so as you can see, Mega Charizard X, it finishes with a time of 1 hour 54 minutes and 45 seconds, and it does not pass the Mewtwo bar, however, I think while editing this video I did spot some things that maybe I could improve on that I didn't see when I was playing and I only saw when I was editing. So just kind of like with the Flygon video, I think there's a little bit of redemption to be had here. So what I'm going to do is stop the recording, I'm going to play another run, and we'll come back and I'll just kind of give you the results of that. Before we look at the improvements, let me just say that the first five or so runs that I recorded and talked about in the previous segment, they weren't that great. It made me feel like I was in a bit of a funk or maybe that I had lost a little bit of my mojo because not only was the route just lacking in several areas, but even things like overworld movement, they felt a little harder than normal. Maybe I was just getting too old. Now the solution, rather than just to release a half-baked video so that I can fuel the YouTube machine, was to take a break. I think this is solid advice and 
all walks of life is that if maybe if you feel like you're underperforming or you're just not doing what you know that you can do just step away come back later with some fresh eyes recharge your batteries try again doing stuff like this it might mean that the next video might be a little bit behind but for me the channel isn't about just making videos or making a little side money it's about doing these pseudo speed runs and playing them well and I just wasn't happy with what I saw but let's get off of that topic and talk about how I came back with a vengeance the very first thing is that wild rattata I mentioned that maybe it didn't save time but I do think it does at the end of the day it will push you to level 8 on Brock it makes the fight a little bit shorter and I even get rewarded with a crit just to save a turn so that was pretty cool now let's talk about something that I've always wanted to do but I just couldn't really ever find the right run after redoing the routing I found that I can cut an additional rare candy and I'm actually gonna cut the Mount Moon candy today now the main reason you would never cut this normally is because the escape rope gives you a really good time save in red and blue in Bill's house but I'm just simply gonna buy an escape rope and I'm also gonna cut out any antidotes potions or paralyzed heals that you just might buy in most runs cutting out this candy does save roughly 25 seconds of in-game time and just with everything else in general I'm already about 40 seconds ahead of my last run which is pretty nice now remember the first run was about 70 seconds away at the end from passing Mewtwo so this is the exact sort of start that you want but we need to keep moving on the next little adjustment here is uh, just better PP management which I think we can all use and it was mainly just utilizing air slash more and just paying attention to damage ranges air slash doesn't have 100% accuracy so you do have that little slight risk of maybe wasting a turn or two but keeping enough dragon and shadow claws here it let me skip healing at the pokey center after I used the escape rope in Bill's house just to save a little bit of extra time next is the vermilion shop buy and skipping things like potions antidotes and paralyzed heals earlier it let me really streamline my inventory here I also skipped super potions as well and this early in the game I already have my inventory perfectly set up I have the helix fossil in the first spot to swap with the bike later followed by repels elixirs four stores and my rare candies they're all lined up and that means I won't have to mess with them for the rest of the entire game now this sounds kind of insignificant but I promise you guys that menuing in general is the single biggest time loss in these kind of runs and I just I really worked on that aspect for this run and I was really happy with it so the run is going to stay pretty much identical for a long while at this point and we can pick up after Pokemon Tower and I have to mention the Snorlax as cool as it is to be able just to be all cutesy and just go ahead and catch it I already alluded to the fact that the Lapras is just a little bit faster so it just didn't make the cut for this run picking back up at Sylph this is where the big changes come in I'm going to make that exact same move pivot as last time but here I'm going to do one huge super menu just to get all the changes in I'm going to learn Earthquake, Rock Slide, Sword Stance just like last time but now I'm also gonna burn the six rare candies I have and this is really significant I'm gonna tell you why while Charizard from this point on without the candies it could usually just set up one sword stance and sweep virtually everything in the entire game the boost in levels here it allows us to skip the setup entirely for the vast majority of battles and I'm showing some in the background like Sabrina Koga Blaine but you got to think about even little things like Giovanni 2 Koga's gym trainers or Giovanni's gym trainers they were all fights where I could save at least one turn and it really started to add up and removing that need for swords dance all the time went a long way to making this Pokemon feel really fast after rival number six I do hit level 51 and with the two candies that I got in Pokemon Mansion I can hit level 53 and this was the new level that I felt really confident about with the elite four so let's take a look Without sugarcoating it, level 55 on the last run, it was an awful call. At level 53, it's the exact same fight, and there's no reason to bloat your time and be a higher level like I did. I actually get some slight bad luck here with an early attack drop from Aurora Beam, so I have to set up an additional time, waste an extra turn, but the rest of the fight just plays out exactly the same, and the rest of the Elite Four is a carbon copy of last time as well. The two extra levels, they literally just made no difference, but at this point, I was just so zoned into the run that I did not notice my time and it was about this point on Lance where I started to wonder what is a Lolan Raichu's time what is Shadow Lugia's time and I was wondering if we had a chance to maybe pass those runs 
The one change in the entire Elite Four was on the champion. The levels kind of catch up to you here, so I have to fully set up all three sword stance, get to plus six attack, and I just need to guarantee the one shot on Executor. For my money, things like Execute, Executor, the drowsy on the dig rocket grunt, putting you to sleep, that's like the biggest potential for time loss in the entire run for most of the solo runs I do, and I just really wanted to avoid it if I could help it. Now, I didn't go Flare Blitz once again because the ranges are a little bit worse because we're a little bit lower level, and a very wonderful side effect of setting up enough to trivialize Executor is that Blastoise is also a one shot, and that's the run over. My intuition here was correct, and Mega Charizard X had a lot left in the tank, and it was enough to save like five and a half minutes off of the previous run. Charizard proves that it does in fact have what it takes to pass the Mewtwo bar, and just like the Clefable run last week, we have a change in the top three. Mega Charizard X steps on the podium at number two, only behind the immaculate Alolan Ninetales, and this run was great. I feel very satisfied that I went back, and I'm just glad that I could do a little bit better, do it some justice. Shadow Lugia does drop out of the top three, and it's going to lead the charge on the next page, and I didn't mention this in the last video, but I overhauled how the tier list looks. Doesn't matter much here, but like in the Gen 1 specific tier list, there's no need to tell you guys what tier something's in. You can see the number. If you look at a Pikachu, for example, if it's 55 out of 100, hey, it's in the F tier, you already know. And I think ordering things in like numerical order here just looks better, but I'm always open for discussion. Unfortunately, this is our 22nd cross gen run, which means I need a third page, and poor Reggie Alecki is just on its own on the page by itself in last place, but I think that's about it for me. I hope you guys enjoyed the run. If you are new to the channel, subscribe for more content, and if you want the patch file just to mess around with, they're always available to members and Patreons. And speaking of members and Patreons, special shout out to you guys. I really appreciate the support, and if you've made it this far in the video, you're a real one, and it means a lot to me. I should be good good to keep pushing for content for maybe a little bit hopefully but I need you to know that in like a couple of weeks or so final exams are going to start to kick in for college and there might be some delays when I'll, I'll be sure to let you know but I'll catch you guys in the next one bye